discuss the connection or connections, the interrelatedness between sleep and Alzheimer's disease. I wanted to just hop right into it. I have Alzheimer's disease on both sides of my family and have seen this up close and personal. What are the connections, if any, between those two? Yeah, I think this is perhaps one of the most exciting areas to have emerged in sleep science over the past maybe five or six years or so. And and just taking a step back, of course, everyone knows that Alzheimer's disease, it's a form of dementia typified by memory impairment and memory decline. And we've learned that there are at least two protein pathological culprits that contribute to Alzheimer's disease. One of those is called beta amyloid, which is a sticky toxic protein that builds up in the brain. And the second is called tau protein. So coming back to your question, how are those things related to sleep? Well, it, it's probably unfolded, gosh, maybe in a three-part or even four-part story. I'm, I'm very nervous to say four-part, and you'll see why in terms of that in just a second. But the three main parts were correlation, causation, and then mechanism. And so Early on, what we started to discover is that individuals who reported sleeping six hours or less across their lifespan had a significantly higher risk of developing high amounts of this toxic beta amyloid and also tau protein in the brain. Then we discovered that two sleep disorders, both insomnia and sleep apnea, which is a condition of sort of heavy snoring, sometimes you stop breathing, it's clinically diagnosed. Both of those conditions were associated with a high risk of both Alzheimer's pathology, but also the transition to early stages and ultimately the transition to full-blown Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I think there was a recent meta-analysis looking at, maybe it was over 27 different studies. And what they found is that people who had sleep problems during the lifespan were about 3.78 times more likely to develop the early stages of Alzheimer's disease in a premature fashion. So those were these epidemiological studies, but those are simply correlational. They're associational. They don't prove you know, causality. So correlation then went in search of causation. And what we've discovered, we and other individuals, some people working in animal studies, we work in humans, but across species, what we found is that if you deprive individuals of a night of sleep, or even if you deprive them selectively of just their deep non-REM sleep across a single night, then the next day we can see an immediate and significant increase in beta amyloid and tau protein circulating in the bloodstream, circulating in what we call the cerebrospinal fluid of the brain, which is this fluid that bathes the brain. And also using special PET scanning images, we've been able to see that same buildup of amyloid within the brain itself. And in fact, there was a recent study that looked at this, these signals of metabolic sort of detritus in the brain. And what they found is that after one night of sleep deprivation, even a full recovery night of sleep was not sufficient to downgrade those metabolic toxins that have been building up in the brain. So, so in that sense, it was a demonstration causally that you can remove this thing called sleep or even selectively excise different types of sleep and you can manipulate the amount of Alzheimer's protein in the brain the next day. So that was the causal evidence. Causation then wanted sort of, you know, a mechanism and perhaps here in some ways that you can reverse engineer it or you can flip it on its head. If that's the bad that happens, if I take sleep away from you, then what is it about sleep when we get it that de-escalates your Alzheimer's disease pathology risk? And this comes onto a series of discoveries. The principal person underlying this was a wonderful scientist at the University of Rochester called Macon Nedegaard. And she was working in mice and she made three stunning discoveries, in my mind at least. The first is that she discovered that the brain has a cleansing system. Now, it sounds strange, you know, many people would think, well, it must have 
because the body has a cleansing system and everyone's familiar with it. It's called the lymphatic system. But we didn't think that the brain had its own cleansing system. She discovered it and it's called the glymphatic system. And it's, it's named, by the way, that way because of the cells that make it up. These, they're called glial cells. They're a different form of brain cell. We've got neurons and we've got glial cells. And it's the glial cells that make up this network of this cleansing system. So that was the first discovery that she made. If that wasn't amazing enough, she then found two more related discoveries. What she then found was that that cleansing mechanism in the brain is not always switched on in high flow volume across the 24 hour period, across the 24 hour clock face. Instead, it was particularly when those mice fell asleep and when they went into deep non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep, um, the other stage of sleep being rapid eye movement sleep, but it was during deep non-REM sleep when that pulsing cleansing system kicked into high gear. And so that was then her sort of shift to then say, well, what are those things that the brain is cleansing during deep sleep? And this is what brings us on to or back to Alzheimer's disease. Two of the pieces of the metabolic byproducts that were being washed away by deep non-REM sleep at night were beta amyloid and tau protein, these two culprits associated with Alzheimer's disease. And scientists in Boston a couple of years ago, and we've now replicated this in humans as well, identified a similar cleansing mechanism in humans using special MRI scans. So that was evidence almost from a, a biochemical perspective. And this is probably slightly hyperbolic to say, and I'm mindful of it, but biochemically, perhaps it's true, which is we were starting to understand that wakefulness was low-level brain damage and sleep was your sanitary salvation. It was almost like a good night sleep clean that was a power cleanse for the brain that was happening during sleep. But this started to explain why you got maybe this trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. It went all the way back to the associational studies. So now we can understand why night after night, if you're not getting the sleep that you need, you're not cleansing the brain of the pathology. And it's, it's not vast that builds up after one night of sleep. And I don't want to scare anyone here. And I've, you know, I'm sure I'll probably get some concerned voices. I'm not trying to make anyone nervous about a bad night of sleep. And the next day you've guaranteed your Alzheimer's disease fate. That, that's not at all the, the situation. But it did help us understand that night after night, if you're not cleansing the brain, it becomes like compounding interest on a loan, that it continues to escalate time and time again, night after night. And then if that wasn't depressing enough, we then went on to make a further discovery that it's a vicious cycle, that Alzheimer's disease pathology, those proteins, do not build up in the brain homogeneously. They don't build up in all areas of the brain equally. And what we discovered is that the parts of the brain that start to get attacked by Alzheimer's disease early on are unfortunately the same regions of the brain that generate deep non-REM sleep. The oh, same stage of sleep that's, that's associated with the cleansing, isn't it just? And so now we'd found this vicious spiral that if you don't get enough sleep each night, you get more of that Alzheimer's buildup. The more that builds up, the less the brain is capable of generating deep sleep. The less deep sleep, the more that builds up. What are the structures involved with the production of that deep non-REM sleep? It's essentially a network of brain regions. Constellation. Exactly. But one of, if you look at it with brain scans or electrical recordings, one of the main epicenters, in fact, probably the principal epicenter that generates this deep sleep is a part of the frontal lobe particularly the middle part of your frontal lobe. So if you sort of put your finger just above your nose and slide it up about an inch and a half, that's the middle part of what we call the prefrontal cortex or the medial prefrontal cortex. That is a deep sleep generating center for the brain. You get a principal dominance of your deep sleep in that part of the brain. And then these big brain waves, they splash on the brain and they actually wave across the brain from the front of the brain to the back, from the front to the back. It's this beautiful mechanism mm. that we can see, this, this sort of wave of these deep, slow brain waves. It's amazing. And so that was a part of the brain that showed these Alzheimer's attacks early on. And it's the same region that is generating the deep sleep in adults. So 
That was mm. the demonstration of mechanism that helped us perhaps go back and explain the associations. Then perhaps the, the fourth ingredient that I'm really, you know, I'm almost nervous to say it because it's the most dangerous of all things, which is the suggestion of hope. And I don't mean to make false sort of promises here, but what I find interesting is that unlike many of the other features that we know are associated with Alzheimer's disease, for example, changes in the physical structure of the brain or even the, the blood flow dynamics of the brain, those are very difficult to treat right now and medicine doesn't have any good wholesale approaches. But if sleep is a missing piece in the explanatory puzzle of aging and Alzheimer's disease, then maybe we can do something about it. Sleep is a modifiable factor. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at this in the laboratory. We've been approaching this not by using sleeping pills, and, and we may come on to those things. They seem to be more blunt instruments that don't produce necessarily naturalistic sleep. But we've been developing some technology. It's called direct current brain stimulation, which, <laughs> which sounds like the stuff of science fiction. It's actually science fact where you apply these pads to your head and you in insert a small amount of voltage into the brain. And it's so small, by the way, that you typically don't feel it, but it has a measurable impact. And early studies demonstrated that if you apply this stimulation during sleep, as if you're sort of singing in time with those deep sleep brainwaves, not only can you amplify the size of those deep sleep brainwaves, but in doing so, people were able to almost double the amount of memory benefit that you get from sleep. So, so the question then was, could we translate that same affordable, potentially portable technology into older adults? And could we restore mm -hmm. back some deep sleep and sort of salvage aspects of learning and memory function? That's, that's one of our goals. And we've been developing this and have a startup company that's public now that's looking at this. To me, though, that is probably not really where I'll ultimately be excited about because Thinking about late stage Alzheimer's disease, when the brain has been pathologized that much, it's very difficult to salvage. I am much more interested in shifting from a model in Alzheimer's of late stage treatment to midlife prevention. Mm -hmm. Because to me, if I look at the sleep data, that's when you start to see the great depression of your deep sleep. <laughs> it's bloody depressing, I know. I'm, I'm an incredibly depressing person. But if you look, it's in your mid to late thirties that we start to see the decline in deep sleep. So could I intervene in middle life and start sort of pushing back against the decline of deep sleep? And in doing so, could we bend the arrow of Alzheimer's disease risk down on itself? So that's so sort of shifting from a model of late stage sick care to a model of midlife health care. I think that's probably a much more reasonable approach.